Tim, you made me feel so much better when you forgot what the song was. I just... I did forget. That was of great encouragement. All right, even the pros, even the pros forget every now and then. I invite you to turn your Bibles, if you would please, to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. If you know where Revelation is, go left. If you can find the book of Romans, go right. It's stuck in between those two uh, R&R books. So the book of Philippians chapter 2. We're getting back to our series we've been engaged in uh, during the summer called Joy and Laughter. You never can have too much. You can only have too little. And the book of Philippians is the foundational book of the Bible that gives us the foundation as well as the fountain of joy. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper into that subject today. There was a city boy who had never, ever been to the farm before. One day he's taken for a visit and he looks around at everything and he looks up at the farmer and he said, Mister, why doesn't that cow have horns? The farmer cocked his head for a moment as he looked at the animal and then he began in a very patient tone. He said, Well, son, cattle can do a powerful lot of damage with their horns. Sometimes we keep them trimmed with a, a saw. Other times we can fix up the young'uns by putting a couple of drops of, of, of a type of acid where their horns would grow and it stops them from growing. Still, there are several breeds of cattle that don't grow horns at all. But son, the reason that cow don't have no horns is because it's a horse. <laughs> you would think... That even a city boy might know the difference between a horse and a cow. But then you would also think that a Christian would know the difference between true faith and what a lot of people call Christianity. In today's passage in Philippians chapter 1 through 4, verses 1 through 4, Paul tells his friends in that church what true faith should look like in the activity of a church fellowship. He goes to great lengths to describe this because what he's talking about doesn't come naturally to any of us. In fact, there are many in churches literally around the world who still have no idea what true faith looks like. The church may have a very sound doctrine. They may even have beautiful facilities. They possibly could have a dynamic preacher, but they still can't tell a horse from a cow when it comes to true faith. So we're going to take a look at this passage and see if we, by the end of today, can figure out the difference between a cow and a horse when it comes to living out our faith. Let's read verses 1 through 4. Follow along if you would. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if you experience any fellowship with his spirit, if there's any tenderness and compassion, then make my what? Joy complete. Make my joy full by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let me, um, let me reread that with maybe a certain emphasis in certain places. Paul says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do you catch the emphasis? Same mind, same love, full agreement. That's what true faith should look like. When Christians live together, like there is a powerful atmosphere of joy and excitement and unity. That is what true faith looks like. But too often, that's not what the world sees when they look at us. There's a story of a church that argued over what color shingles they should put on the roof. Now, I've never experienced that in church life. I, I have known pastors who had church splits because the church couldn't agree on the color of the pews 
and the carpet. That's why you all never get a choice around here. Okay? We, we, we're just going to save that argument, all right? But this one particular church fought over the colors of the shingles on the roof. One, one, one part of the church wanted red shingles. Another part wanted green shingles. After a lot of bickering, they finally came to a compromise. Half the house was red. Half the roof was green. Settled the argument. And from that moment on, the folks who voted for a red roof sat on the side that had the red shingles. And the folks who voted for the green roof sat on the side with the green shingles. We laugh at that, and yet I have it on good authority. That is a true story. Now, God knew what was going to happen from the very beginning. He knew people would have a hard time living up to his standard. He knew that we'd have difficulty being of one mind and one love. And there's a reason why this was going to be hard for us. And the writer of Philippians spells this out for us in another one of the books that he wrote in Romans chapter 3. He spells it out very succinctly in verse 23 when he says, We have all sinned and every one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. I fell short at birth and have never recovered. I was waiting for you to say something. I, I tossed you a softball, Fawn. <laughs> every Christian in church, every one of us who says we are a believer in Jesus Christ and we're given that name Christian, not because we earned it, it was a gift to us. And every one of us who go by that name, we come from the same sinful mindset. And there are times we have a hard time leaving our old character in the past. I look at you and I know that there are some of you who've been Christians for decades. Not because you look like you're decades old, but just because I know you've been a Christian for a long time. Does your old character sneak up and bite you every now and then? probably for most of us, more often than we want to admit. It's there. That is why Paul wrote this stuff to his friends at the church that he started a decade before. If we understand what Paul is telling us here, if we decide to take the prescription he sets forth in this passage, then you and I can become of one mind and of one love. And then we will not only look like Christians, but we will actually be the Christians that we've already become. So, what's the diagnosis and what is the remedy? When, when we're not feeling well and we go to the doctor, we go there with two things in mind, right? We want a diagnosis. What do I got? And number two, we want a remedy. We want a prescription. Paul does both of that for us in this passage. So what's the diagnosis? It's spelled out for us in verses two and three. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. There's a diagnosis. Our problem is rooted in our old sin nature, and it's the fact that we have this capacity to be very selfish people, and with that selfishness to be very ambitious. It's looking out for our own interests first that leads to problems in the church. I want a red roof. And that becomes more important than anything else. You, you see, that's how a horse ends up looking like a cow in church. Let me read the passage again. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. There's the remedy. In humility, count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests. There, there is a part of us that needs to take care of ourselves, but also look to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, which is also the mind of Christ. It's these things, this humility that can help us look like a Christian. Now also notice what Paul's saying here. It's okay to look after your own interests, supply things for your family. You, you, you need to earn an income to pay your bills. You, you need to provide food. You need to put a roof over your head. You need to take care of this body God's given us. But, but what happens too often is that, that we Christians focus mostly on ourselves and other Christians and kingdom matters fall way, way back to a distant second if they even show up in the race at all. But, but humility, humility is the remedy. Rick Warren reminds us not that, you, that humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. 
I like that. Let me see if I can help you understand what I'm getting at here. Uh, there were, there's a story about two fourth grade classrooms. In both classes, the teacher introduced a game to them called balloon stomp. Seems like a crazy thing for a teacher to do in a classroom. Did you ever play the game? You, you tie a string to your ankle and you go out about three feet and you tie the other end to a balloon. And the object of the game is to be the last one standing with his balloon not popped. And so you go around stamping on everybody else's balloon and you're trying to protect your own balloon. I don't know about if I was a teacher, I don't think I would do that game. Probably control after that would be impossible. But anyway, they, they did it in, in, in this one classroom. And um, when the teacher said go, it was a mad dash flurry of activity. Kids shouting and stomping on balloons. A few of the kids clung to the sidelines like wallflowers at a middle school dance. But their balloons were doomed just the same. The entire battle was over in just a matter of seconds, leaving only one balloon intact. And you can only imagine who the owner of that one balloon was. He was the most disliked kid in the classroom. He was the kid who was the bully and pushy and rude and offensive, and he didn't care how he got the balloon stomped. He stomped everybody's balloon. Now, there was another second grade class that was introduced to the same game. But this class was made up of children with some special needs. Perhaps the directions were given too quickly and the kids didn't fully grasp what was being said, but the one idea that got through to all the kids is that their balloons had to be popped. And they approached the game differently than the first class. Instead of fighting with each other, they began to help each other pop the balloons. One little girl took her balloon and held it down and asked the boy next to her to stomp on it for her. And then he thought that was so nice, he did the same thing with his. He held his balloon and asked the little girl to stomp on his. It went on like this in that room for several minutes until all the balloons were destroyed. And as soon as the last balloon popped, everybody cheered because everybody won. Now, aside from their identifiable special needs, and quite frankly, folks, I'm not sure which one should be identified as a special needs group. What was the difference in those two classrooms? You see, the first classroom saw the game as my balloon. And so they sought to look out for their own interests. The second classroom saw the game as we have to win. And they sought to look out for each other's interests. The second class, it wasn't about me. It was about we. And that is what Paul is talking about in this passage. One of the first conductors born and educated in the United States to receive worldwide acclaim was Leonard Bernstein. He directed the New York Philharmonic, conducted concerts by some of the world's leading orchestras, wrote symphonies, wrote music for Broadway, plays such as West Side Story. The New York Times published his obituary on October the 15th, 1990. And they called him one of the most talented and successful musicians in American history. Bernstein once was asked which instrument was the most difficult instrument to play in an orchestra, and he said, second fiddle. I can get plenty of first violinists, but to find someone who can play second fiddle with enthusiasm, that's a problem. Because even in an orchestra, it can be about me and not we. Or as Harry Truman, president of the U.S., once said, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Oh, if our current Democratic and Republican officials could learn that story. I hope none of you took offense because I included all y'all. All right? I didn't leave any. Oh, independence. If y'all could figure that out, we'd be miles ahead. Uh, Paul defines humility in Philippians 2 this way. Count others more significant than yourself. But Paul didn't stop here. Notice what he writes next. Have this mind among yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who in the form of God did not count equality with God the thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the human likeness of a man, found in human form. He humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. I see two things here. Uh, 
First, Paul tells us that we all need to be like Jesus, the mind of Christ functioning in us. The more that we all become like Jesus, the more we will all be of the same mind and the same love. We see too often church people, and and, I'm not talking about the individual church person, I'm talking about us as a church people, we are often two-faced. I wish I could show this on a screen, but often as a church we show two faces. We have this conflict. We want what we want, and another person in the church wants what they want, and they're not the same thing. And so we have this church that's got a blue roof, I mean a red roof and a green roof. I just threw bigger conflict into that problem and I gave them a blue choice. (laughs) But once we put Jesus in the mix, we begin to reflect him to decide not what do I want or what do you want, but what does he want? As we start being more like him, we get closer to each other. Again, I wish I could have done a diagram. Think of a triangle for a moment. You're at one bottom corner and I'm at the other bottom corner and we're a long ways apart. And you're saying over here, I wish you would be like me. And you over here saying, I wish you would agree with me. And there's a big distance here. Now, at the top of that triangle is Jesus. Now, if over here, I stop thinking about what I want and what you want me to be, and I focus on him to become who he wants me to be, as I go up the triangle, I become more and more like who? Jesus. And then you're over here, and you stop thinking about what I want you to be and what you want you to be and you focus on who Jesus wants you to be and as you climb the ladder of this triangle or pyramid, who are you becoming like? And so when we get to here and we look at each other, who do we see? Down here we were so far apart, but up here, wow, we become united together because it's about him. The second thing is this. Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, something to be grasped, but emptied himself. This is verses 6 through 8. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, the death on the cross. What Paul's trying to tell us here is, is it's all about who is in charge of the church. I always get nervous when somebody says to me, Tim, I'm going to come to your church. Don't come to my church. You won't like it very much. Well, why not? I thought you like. New Hope's not my church. And if you come because this is my church, you all aren't as bright as you look. This is God's church. Tim, what's going to happen if you ever... This is God's church. It's going to get better. Because that's what growth and maturity does. It gets better. Too much in the church reminds me of an old Beatles song. There are some of you in this room who have no idea who the Beatles are, huh? Have <laughs> <laughs> you ever heard the Beatles music? Okay, all right. Out of play, go, mom and dad. All right. Uh, actually, grandma and grandpa, way to go. You played them some Beatles music. Elvis, yeah, yeah, yeah. The old Beatles had a song called Try to See It My Way. Do you remember that song? Here's the words. Think of what you're saying. You can get it wrong and still you think it's all right. Think of what I'm saying. We can work it out and get it straight or say goodnight. We can work it out. We can work it out. Life is very short and there's no time for fussing and fighting, my friend. I have always thought that it's a crime, so I will ask you once again, try to see it my way. Only time will tell if I am right or if I am wrong. While you see it your way, there's a chance that we might fall apart before too long. We can work it out. We can work it out. You understand what this song is saying? We can work it out if you see it my way. (laughs) That's the way of our old nature. It is not the way of the mind of Christ, which is to be the same in you as he is in me. You see, there's a power struggle issue. A struggle over my right to have my way. But then this Jesus thing gets in the way. 
Jesus Christ, who thought he was the form of God, did not count equality with God, something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Now, Jesus was God, but he did not use his godhood as an excuse to be superior, though he was. Instead, he emptied himself and became a servant. And what rights do a servant have? Zero. None. Jesus surrendered his rights, and now he wants you and I to learn to do the same. So if I follow Jesus' example, I will empty myself of my rights. My major focus will be on helping you get your way. I will focus on making you successful. I will try to help you meet your dreams and goals because that's what Jesus did. And if, if while I'm reflecting Jesus in me by helping you be all that you want to be, and if you are doing the same in return, if you are helping others to become all that they desire to be, then guess what the outcome is? Paul says, complete joy by being of the same mind, the same love, in full accord. It's often the same principle is true in marriage. If I'm asking Shelly, what do you need? And if Shelly's asking me what I need and I spend my life meeting her needs and she spends her life meeting my needs, guess who's happy? Both of us. But if just one of us is asking, what are you going to do to make me happy? Who's happy? Nobody. Oh, the one who's getting their needs met for a while. But you never can satisfy a selfish person. Ever. You never can do enough. And then if both of you are asking the same question, what are you going to do to make me happy? You're going to see a judge. That's where it ends up. So how is all this made possible? The scripture says Jesus humbly died the death of the cross. Why? Because that is what we needed. We needed his death to remove our guilt and our shame, and then he rose again to come live within us. But we must die to ourselves so he can express his life through us. Paul, who wrote Philippians and also wrote Romans, also wrote the, wrote the book of Galatians. And in Galatians 2, 20 and 21, he said, I ha and I'm going to read this from the Amplified Translation. He says, I have been and continue to be crucified with Christ. What does crucifixion the picture of? Death. Perfect. And Jesus humbly did what? Died to meet our needs. The servant died to meet our needs. Now what the king, who became a servant, is asking of us is to do the same thing that he did. Die. Not a physical death but a spiritual one. I have been crucified and continue to be crucified with Christ so that it's not I who is piloting this ship, but it's Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in this body, I live by faith and trust in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself to me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through good works, then Christ died for nothing. Let me give you a brief theology lesson. I know theology, we tend to lose people in a sermon. But this is important. There are two key, key critical theological perspectives that every Christian needs to come to grips with and understand. So, so just hang with me. It won't take long. The first word is justification. It's a theological term. Literally, simply translated, it means just as if I'd never sinned. That is what happens at the exact moment that we give our life to Jesus Christ. When we admit the reality of, of Romans 3.23, that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and then if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, the scripture says, I will be saved. What that literally means is I am now justified. Now, when God looks at me, his son stands in my place, and the father sees Tim Rowland in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it looks like Tim Rowland has never, ever sinned. That is really good news, isn't it? That's the way God looks at us. We are justified. That is a one-time transaction. You never get more justified than you are at the moment that you're saved. You can't do anything to give you more and more justification. You are fully justified once and done. Then there's a second term. And we all love that one. The first one's really cool. Now the second one 
is sanctification. Sanctification. To sanctify means to set apart for the master's use. When we are justified, that is the beginning of sanctification. But when we are justified, it's finished and done. When we are now sanctified, we are starting a process that doesn't end until God calls us home. It's a process of spiritual growth and maturity and development in him. And the only way for sanctification to progress is for you and I to choose to die. To do exactly what Paul talked about here that Jesus did for us. He came humbly out of humility. Though he was a king, he came humbly as a servant. For what purpose? To die to his own ambitions, desires, and needs. He came to take care of you and me. And once we have received the justification of Jesus Christ, Jesus now asks, will you make the same choice for me that I made for you? I died to myself so that you might live. Will you now die to yourself that I might live in you? And every demand that Jesus puts on your life and my life to love each other. I know you can look around this room and say, Tim, I really got to love that person. Yep. But you don't have to. Die to your hatred and live in the love of Christ. Die to your angst and live in in the peace of Christ. Die to your frustration and live in the joy of Christ. Death to self, alive to him. Why is this important? Because of what was written in Galatians chapter 5. For you, my brothers, were called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom become an opportunity for your old nature, your selfishness, but through love Serve and seek the best for one another. Does he sound like he's saying the same thing again? Same author of Galatians as Philippians, as Romans. He is so consistent here. In other words, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean your old nature is destroyed. It still functions. Verse 14, for the whole law concerning human relationships is fulfilled in this one precept. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That is, you shall have an unselfish concern for others and do things for their benefit. But if you bite and devour each other by bickering and arguing, watch out that you along with your entire fellowship won't be consumed by one another. So I say, verse 16, walk habitually. What does that mean? Continuously. Walk habitually. You are to be a walking dead man. Walking habitually in the Spirit. And then you will certainly not carry out the desires of your old sinful nature. Which responds impulsively without regard for God and his precepts. Any of you ever have an anger issue? And not everybody has anger issues. But, but, but a few do. Is it okay? It's okay to admit it. We have Celebrate Recovery here. Okay. All right. All right. There was a time, man, in my younger days who I could get angry just like that. Just, just like that. I know it's hard to believe. I'm so mellow now. But... In the old days. And you know what? It's not good for a little guy to be the angriest person on the school campus. It, it, that's not, it's not smart. I learned to get over my anger because I couldn't defend myself well enough. But just because we become a Christian doesn't mean that anger goes away at the moment of our justification. It requires sanctification for us to deal with whatever our bigger challenges are. Maybe yours is telling the truth. You probably won't stop exaggerating the truth just immediately after you become a Christian. It requires sanctification. Recognizing this is my old nature. Rendering it non-functional through identification and the crucifixion of Christ so that it's Christ living in us. Verse 17, for the sinful nature has its desires and they are opposed to the spirit and the desire of the spirit opposes the sinful nature. For these two, the sinful nature and the spirit are in direct opposition to each other so that you do not do whatever you want to do and you do do the things you don't want to do and that's why we all end up in doo-doo. But, but if you are guided and led by the spirit, we are not subject 
to the old nature. Now the practices of the sinful nature are evident. They are immorality, impurity, sensuality, which is a total irresponsibility or a lack of control, idolatry, sorcery. And we say, well, good, I don't qualify for any of those anymore. Hold on. Hostility, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions that promote heresies, envy, drunkenness, riotous behavior, and other things like these. I warn you beforehand, as I've done before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, I love the buts in scripture. But the fruit of the Spirit, the result of his presence in us, is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, a life under control. Against such things there is no restriction or law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified their sinful nature with its passions and an appetite. Paul says, how often do I do this thing of sanctification? I die to self every day. Rob Frazier wrote a song with these words, a Christian songwriter. He said, dead people don't mind the pain. Don't get offended, so they never complain. They're not concerned about personal gain. Does that sound like me or you? The truth is rising from the mist, and the word is this, that when Jesus calls a man, he calls them to come and die. He doesn't want you better. He wants you deader. That's exactly what Jesus said throughout his ministry. Die to self live to Christ. Let me wrap this up. In Donald Miller's book that he wrote about 18 years ago, Blue Light Jazz, there's a chapter called Love, How to Really Love Other People. He was at a lecture by a gentleman by the name of Greg Spencer that talked about the metaphors we use about relationships. He said we talk about how we value people, invest in people, how we say people are priceless, that relationship might be bankrupt. All these metaphors are economic ones. And that's when it hit me, he said, like so much epiphany getting dislodged from my arteries, the problem with Christian culture is we think of love as a commodity. We use it like money. Professor Spencer was right, and not only was he right, but I felt as though he had cured me. Cured me as though he had, had let me out of my cage. I could see clearly now if somebody is doing something for us, offering us something, be it gifts or time or popularity or, or what have you, we feel that we have value. We feel that we are worth something. And perhaps we feel that they are priceless. I could see it so clearly. I could feel it in the pages of my life. This was the thing that smelled so rotten in my life all these years. I used love like money. The church often uses love like money. With love, we withhold affirmation from people who we do not agree with, but we lavishly finance the ones we do. There was a guy in my life at that time, a guy I went to church with whom I honestly didn't like. I thought he was sarcastic and lazy and manipulative, and he ate with his mouth open so that food fell off on his chin when he talked. He began and ended every conversation with the word, dude. He began to get under my skin, and I wanted him to change. I wanted him to read a book, memorize a poem, explore morality, at least do something that had an intellectual concept to it. I didn't know how to communicate to him that he needed to change, so I displayed it on my face. I rolled my eyes. I gave him dirty looks. I would mouth the word, loser, when he wasn't looking. I thought somehow he would sense my disapproval and want to change his behavior in order to gain my favor. In short, I withheld love. After Greg Spencer's lecture, I knew what I was doing was wrong. It was selfish. And what's more, it wasn't going to work. By withholding love from my friend, he became defensive. He didn't like me much anymore. He thought I was judgmental, snobbish, proud, and mean. Rather than being drawn to me and wanting to change, he was repulsed. I was guilty of using love like money, withholding it to get somebody to be who I wanted them to be. I was making a mess of everything, and I was disobeying God. If Jesus, our master, was known as a friend of tax collectors, shouldn't we? We are to be the light of the world. How many dark places and dark hearts are you and I shining in right now? At the main entrance of Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, is a portrait of a man with an inscription underneath that says, James Butler Bonham. No picture of him exists. This portrait is his nephew, Major James Bonham, deceased, who greatly resembled his uncle. It is placed here by the family that you might know the appearance of the man who died for our freedom. There is no literal portrait that I know of that exists of Jesus Christ either. But the likeness of the one who died to set all men free ought to be seen in your life and your life and your life and your life and our life. When they look at us, 
they ought to see Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I trust that you have spoken today. And I trust that we have listened. And now we must choose what to do with what we've heard. I pray we will choose to die to self and live in the fullness of all that you've promised so that all of our joy will be full and running over. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good day.